Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There are dreams, and then there are dreams. There are dreams that um, are of lesser importance. Those are the ones that you have at night. And maybe depending upon what you ate for dinner, it will affect whether or not it is a good dream or a nightmare. But then there are dreams that I would refer to as the big D sort of dreams. These are the visions that you have while you are awake and they compel you and they give you focus and they give you purpose and you live within those dreams in order to see how life and the world and others can be better than they are now. And so when Martin Luther King Jr. stood at the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in August of 1963 and he said, I have a dream. He was not speaking about a nocturnal vision. He was speaking about a vision that he woke with every day and it gave him his life and his direction. It was a dream of equality among all people. And I asked the question, where did that dream come from? What was the power behind that dream? Now I have dreams, not nearly as exciting as Martin Luther King's dreams. Just recently I had a dream of a bunch of people getting together and gathering and going to Germany. In this, the 500th anniversary of the Lutheran Reformation, a dream of being able to visit the sites where Luther began his ministry and informed his ministry to the point of changing the course not only of Christianity in the Western world, but also of so many other things. And that dream came into reality. 36 of us went to Germany, 35 came home. That's, that's not a bad app. And we saw where Luther was born and where he died and where he was baptized. We saw where he taught and where he preached. We saw the place in which he nailed the 95 theses on the church door wall, and we saw the place in which he translated the scriptures from Hebrew and Greek into the common language that every German person could read and understand. And we saw many other sites, and we tasted Oktoberfest beer, and it was awesome. <laughs> but where did the power of that dream come from? Whenever I gather with a couple who is planning to get married, I ask them, besides getting married and being able to commit your, yourself to one another in front of a group of people, what are you looking forward to on the day of your wedding? Inevitably, 99% of the time they say, I'm looking forward to gathering with family and friends. What is the power behind that dream. I would submit to you today that the common theme of those three areas of dreams is not only the gathering of people, but even more importantly, the understanding that you belong, that we belong, that we belong together. Sociologists tell us that one of the most primal importance of every individual on the face of this earth is to know that they belong. So when Martin Luther King Jr. spoke about this dream of racial equality, he was looking forward to that day when all people, all races, all minorities would find a place of belonging in the American dream. And when I had this dream of going to Germany with a group of people, it was not only to gather with folks within the church and have an experience together, but even more importantly, was to know where we belong in our Lutheran theological heritage. And then when couples get married, it's that important moment to know that while they're beginning a new family, they're equally acknowledging that they belong to a group of people who raised them and brought them to this place and now celebrate in this exciting day. We gather in order to belong. What sort of dreams do you have? What sort of gatherings do you look forward to what sort of sense of belonging 
compels your life. I think that Jesus had a dream of gathering with others. I mean, why was it that he chose 12 disciples when he began his ministry? He did not need them. If anybody was self-sufficient, it was Jesus. He did not need a single one of those disciples to help him become the Messiah. And yet he chose them. And you have to wonder why. Why did he choose these 12 guys? Not the brightest bulbs in the world. Peter. Peter, who is the spokesman for the group, quick to act, quick to speak, but slow to think. And James and John. You know what their nicknames were? The Sons of Thunder. In other words, these were not quiet guys. These were not peaceable guys. These were rough and tumble, ready to go at it any moment kind of guys. And then there was Simon the Zealot. You know what zealots are? A zealot was a participant in a factious group that was dedicated to overthrowing the Roman government. In other words, Simon was a terrorist. And then there was Matthew. Matthew the tax collector. Now Matthew was Jewish, but all the Jews hated Matthew because he worked for the Roman government. Can't you imagine the smile on Jesus' face when he said to Simon and Matthew, okay, you two guys, you room together. <laughs> and then there was Thomas the doubter and Bartholomew, who's probably not even Jewish. And then, of course, Judas. Judas, the guy who held the money, and Judas, the guy who would betray Jesus. Really, Jesus, is this the best you can do in choosing others to gather with you in your ministry? Somehow, that was his dream. And you know what? It was good that it was his dream. Because, well, because if Jesus had any higher standards in what it meant to hang around them, then I would suspect that very few of you could meet those standards. And I know that I couldn't. Is it likely that Jesus purposely chose a bunch of nitwits in order to make the point that you all can be a part of the gathering that Jesus is making happen? This reading from John chapter 10 is a great one. Jesus is in the gathering business. He goes to extreme measures to collect people, to bring people in, and he's not necessarily going to the A-listers, they're accepted as well, but he's especially going to the people who don't make the cut, who don't make the grade. And he says, y'all, come on in, be a part. He says that he's the gate by which all gather together in his kingdom. But let's be honest, let's be honest. Jesus is not so good at being a gate. A gate is an opening to a fence, and the role of a fence is to keep things out. And so the gate selectively opens and closes to let people come and go. But Jesus seems to have an awfully difficult time keeping that gate closed. I would suggest to you he's not crazy about fences either. There's an old pastor joke, goes something like this. St. Paul is the CEO of heaven. And one day he calls for a meeting with St. Peter, who is in charge of security. He positions himself at the pearly gates. And Paul comes to Peter and says, we've got a problem. According to my ledger, there are more people in heaven that have come, than have come in the front doors of the gates. They decide to adjourn the meeting, to do a little study and reflection. A couple of days later, Peter comes back to, to Paul and says, I got the solution. Here's what's happening. At night, Jesus is throwing people over the wall. <laughs> Here's the thing. You are a part of Jesus' dream and gathering all people together so that you will belong. When Jesus dreamt of who would be in his kingdom, he thought of every single one of you. 
He's not one who is easily overwhelmed with pomp and circumstance. He cares nothing about social position in life. Wealth and riches mean nothing to him. All are welcome. All are welcome. And he dreamt that you would belong. In like manner, today's worship service was the dream of some people that we might gather together. Not my dream, but these people came to me and said, hey, how about if we do a single service at Mooney Grove Park? Wouldn't that be awesome? And I think it was a great idea, a dream that truly does incorporate the belonging of our congregation together. And not just Christ Lutheran Church as you know it, but also our law school congregation. And the reason why this dream, I think, is so deeply important is because it's a part of a larger dream. If you were in worship last week, you heard and even participated in a prayer where Pastor Sammy was lifted up and recognized for going to seminary, accomplishing his seminary classes, very close now to ordination. And in order to be ordained, the ELCA has decided that he will be ordained as a pastor of Christ Lutheran Church. Now for that to happen, there are bishops, seminary leaders, judicatory heads, and a whole host of other individuals who are working closely with our congregation to incorporate that which you know to be Christ Lutheran Church along with our Lahu community that there will be a time and a day when we will all be one church. That is what has to happen for Sammy to be ordained into ministry in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. It is an exciting thing. It is a dream that I believe that God has had for our congregation and for the law group for some time. It's still in the dream stage, but it is unfolding even as I speak. So today, today is a great day to celebrate what it means for us to be gathered. I've got to tell you this, every Sunday at this time is a fulfillment of a dream that I have of what it means to be the people of God. Every Sunday, every worship service is the highlight of my week, 8 o'clock, 9.30, 11 o'clock, and even 1 o'clock in the afternoon when I join the Lahu worship. And it doesn't matter what songs we sing, doesn't matter if the sermon is good, doesn't matter if the coffee is strong, actually it does matter if the coffee is strong. <laughs> but Sundays are the best, they're the highlight, they're the visible demonstration and proclamation that we gather and we belong. I think Martin Luther thought that. When he described what the Christian church was, he said that the Christian church is a called, gathered, enlightened, and sanctified community of faith. Those four words are the words that we are using in this month of October as we present our worship themes on Sunday. Called, that was last week. Gathered, that's today. Enlightened next week, sanctified two weeks from today. And that means that what we are up to and what we are doing is not about ourselves. This is God's idea. To be gathered is to be connected to one another, to live with one another, to discover God with one another, to learn what forgiveness is with one another, because we know that one another, we make mistakes and we mess up. One of the highlights for me of our trip to Germany a couple of weeks ago was visiting the Buchenwald concentration camp outside the small village of Weimar. It was important to me because this camp was one of three that uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the, um, the Lutheran pastor, the Nazi resistor, was um, imprisoned in for a period of time. Bonhoeffer lived a very short life. At age 39, he was hung by the Nazis. But the things that he said and the manner in which he lived out his life 
remains to be a, a strong and visible testimony of what it means to be a person of faith. In his book, Life Together, Bonhoeffer wrote these words, he who loves the dream of a community more than the Christian community itself becomes a destroyer of the latter. Simply to say, we're not perfect. Jesus is perfect. We are not perfect. We will make mistakes. But you see, that's what it means to be gathered as a community. To live through our imperfections, to recognize and celebrate our differences, to forgive when we have been hurt, to pick up others when they fall, that's what it means to belong. And I wish to tell you this morning that there is a bigger dream that is taking place. Not just getting together with loved ones, not just gathering as we are in this park for a Sunday worship, but a truly expansive dream, a dream where all people, think about this, all people will someday be gathered together. You see, that was God's dream from the very beginning. Do you remember when God called Abram in the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis? God said to Abraham, I will bless you so that you will be a blessing to others. He said, in you, in you, all families on earth will be blessed. You see, God does not simply call together and gather the Jews or the Lutherans or the Christians. God wishes to gather all people together. And that's where you come in. That's your charge, to be a part of this kingdom gathering to bring about invitation to those who are yet to be gathered in, yet to belong to God's great dream. In John chapter 10, we hear Jesus say that there are many voices which would call us aside and leave us empty, but such is the call of Jesus for whom we receive abundant life, abundant life. Who do you know? who is just an invitation away from saying yes to that abundant life. So, there are six simple words that I wish to share with you this morning. Six simple words that you can utter easily, quickly, and effectively. Are you ready for them? You should come to my church. <laughs> That's it. You should come to my church. Say those with me. You should come to my church. Who do you know who needs a church family? You should come to my church. Who do you know who is struggling with something and needs the assistance of others? You should come to my church. Who do you know who has questions about God, about the Bible, about faith? You should come to my church. Who do you know who has been burned by a judgmental church in the past? You should come to my church. Who do you know who has trouble with addictions and who needs to put a name to a higher power? You should come to my church. Who do you know who is wrestling with emotional limitations? You should come to my church. Who do you know who has lost a loved one and who is deep in grief? You should come to my church. Who do you know who woke up on Monday morning to the news of devastation and senseless tragedy in the city of Las Vegas, and once again questions whether or not there is a God in this world who would allow such things to take place, and frustrated that people hurt one another so wantonly, you should come to my church. Our sister congregation in Las Vegas, Community Lutheran Church, I have been in touch with their pastor, Mark Wickstrom, Mark, who is a friend of Christ Lutheran Church, who has been with us in the past, and he tells me this devastation has rippled throughout his congregation in significant ways. Though they did not lose anyone from the congregation, they have people who have lost friends, they have first responders who are on the scene, they have people who work in the medical community who helped out those who are coming into the trauma center. There is great grief within the community of Lutheran Church in Las Vegas. Our prayers are with them, but they equally voice out 
to the voices of those who are in their community who are struggling this very moment, you should come to my church. May God bless us as we live out what it means to be a part of God's dream, to be his disciples, whoever we are, to gather as God's church, to invite others through this open gate who is Jesus himself and to belong to him and to one another. That is a dream worth living for. Amen. I invite you to rise and give a high five to those who are near you.